If you will, open your Bibles to the book of Esther. The book of Esther, chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 14 in just a moment. Again, the book of Esther, uh, chapter 4. Our reading will begin in verse 14, continue uh, through verse 17. I grew up, came of age, was converted in the 1970s. Uh, You don't have to tell me, my grandson already told me this morning that I'm getting old, that I have gray hair. And so, uh, indeed, uh, those things are true. But one of the hallmarks of much of that which passed for evangelical preaching uh, during that decade uh, was that a pastor Uh, would take uh, the week or the day's newspaper uh, or maybe a television news report and with great confidence uh, tell the congregation that what had just occurred uh, in the world was actually the fulfillment of a particular passage of Scripture or was indeed looking forward to the final fulfillment of uh, a passage. Now, I don't do that, okay, because I'm not sure sometimes as to what, how things are being put together uh, by the God who puts all things together well. But it did not, or it did catch my attention this week as I began the final week of preparation for the preaching of the book of Esther, that on Monday morning I was informed that Iran had attacked Israel. Iran occupies that which was ancient Persia. And our text today, the book of Esther, is set in the book of Persia. Now, as to whether or not there's any great relevance to those realities, I'll leave it up to you, okay? We'll just deal with the text that we have uh, at hand. But at any rate, uh, I thought it was a bit interesting. And so today, we're going to survey the book of Esther and hopefully take a bit of time uh, to consider, to think about, uh, to apply uh, one of the central messages in terms of application uh, from the book of Esther uh, that is for such a time as this. So read with me, if you will, beginning in verse 14 of chapter 4 of the book of Esther. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, uh, three days, night or day. I and my young men, women will also fast as you do. And then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Pray with me, if you will. Father, how I pray this morning that your word, which is true, your word, which is always relevant, will be rightly understood for the sake of right proclamation, for the sake of right application to our hearts and to our minds. Uh, We thank you for this great testimony of your faithfulness, and we thank you for the experience of your faithfulness in our own lives. Indeed, Our hope, our confidence is this, that indeed you will be faithful until the end. May we see Jesus as high and lifted up. And we ask uh, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the book of Esther, and since our series is entitled Route 66, It is appropriate to think of our journey 
uh, through the Bible as that of traveling along a highway and coming to a scenic vantage point. Now, I, like most likely many of you, have different modes, different methods, and different missions when you travel. I recently went to Breckenridge, Colorado, and to get there, uh, you have to take about a 75-mile drive on I-70. It is a beautiful drive, and uh, in fact, the geology, geography, topology, uh, probably even the anthropology, and certainly the biology that you would see on that 70 miles is very different from what we would experience here on the eastern side of our country. Now, when I go on vacation or travel, uh, many times it is for the sake of seeing certain sites. And I am very much on board with, stop right here, let's stop, get the cameras out, traipse around, make lots and lots and lots of pictures. But the trip to Breckenridge wasn't that kind of trip. And that I consistently frustrated my wife as she would see things that she wanted to get a picture of. And because that was not my mission on that day, we did not stop. We had to get to Breckenridge. We had to go rent the ski equipment. We had to go buy groceries. We had to check into our places that we were going to stay. And then we had to go eat supper. And then guess what? Because I grew up in the 70s. That, don't, that doesn't mean I am 70, okay? It means I grew up in the 1970s. <laughs> but by the time we finished all that, it was time to go to bed. And so there was no time for sightseeing on that particular day, on that particular trip. But as we come to the book of Esther on our Route 66 traverse of the entirety of the Bible, I think it's an appro appropriate scenic overlook for us to pause. We come to the end of the historical books. Esther is the 17th book in our Old Testament. If you take your Bible and just look at how the pages are numbered, it's about half of the pages dedicated, a little less than half of the pages dedicated uh, to the Old Testament. And so we can look back over about 3,500 years of biblical history, and in fact, we can look forward uh, to that which we know uh, occurred from our vantage point there at, uh, at Esther. And so I think it's uh, worthwhile for us at this juncture to, to, to think about uh, what we have seen and heard, and again, what we will see and hear as we continue uh, our journey. And so with those things in mind, as we get into the book of Esther, I want to consider Esther's historical setting. And I mentioned this on Wednesday night, that I've been listening to a podcast. And this particular podcaster uh, devoted 185 episodes to the study of the book of Esther, of which 41 of them was before he got to chapter 1, verse 1. That is, he spent 41 episodes, about five hours, dealing with the fascinating historical context in which the story of Esther uh, was set. And, and so, uh, we need to understand how it is that God's people came to be uh, within the city of Susa, within the nation of Persia. And again, we will see uh, that God had a plan that he was carrying through, through the entirety of this time. I think one of the difficulties we have, and just nod your head if you agree when I finish saying this, in reading our Bibles is just keeping things in order. Real quick, who came first, Moses or Abraham? Don't say anything. But you, I mean, it's one of those things, you just kind of have to think about it for just a moment as to who uh, came first. 
All of you know Abraham, right? You do know that. I expected you to. But guess what? Next week, after studying a time period around 480 B.C., we go to the book of Job, and most commentators think that Job was a contemporary of Abraham. So we go all the way back to, uh, to, to 2000 B.C., and it just kind of gets the way we order things in our brains out of kilter and makes it difficult for us uh, to learn. And when we move forward into the prophetic books, well, the earliest prophetic books were written around 800 B.C., the, the last of the prophetic books uh, written closely at the time associated uh, with Esther. And so many times if you just kind of pick your Bible up and you turn to a book of the Old Testament and you don't realize, okay, what went before it, what was going on during the time it was uh, written, what was going on during the time the events described were occurring, and what's happened since then, uh, it can get very hard to get these things organized, assimilated, and applied in uh, your brain. And so uh, you're probably familiar, you probably know that Esther is one of the two books in our Bible that's named after a woman, the other one being thank you, the book of Ruth, in which uh, the title character is also uh, the main character in the story. And so our story opens and it tells us that the events described occurred during the reign of one king whose name is Ahasuerus. And he ruled in Persia from about 486 B.C., to 465 B.C. That's about 21 years. Now, we kind of laugh about this, but I, I think that, that it's, that's a good thing. It's a good place to just kind of that, put that mental peg in place so you can build on it. But the events described in Esther occur about 100 years after the fall of Jerusalem, which occurred in 586 B.C. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, I mean, and we kind of joke about it, but it's just, that's just a good thing to have in your head what happened before it, what happened afterward, okay? Now, we've mentioned a couple of times in these sermons uh, from Ezra and Nehemiah, and as I preach Second Chronicles, these events occur about 50 years after the Edict of Cyrus, okay, where Cyrus decrees just as Isaiah prophesied that God's anointed, whose name was Cyrus, again, written hundreds of years before Cyrus was born, that he would lead or send God's people back to the land that God had promised uh, to give them. And so, both the book of Second Chronicles and the book of Ezra notes and quotes that particular uh, decree. So we're looking at a time subsequent to this decree of Cyrus, subsequent uh, to the fall of Jerusalem. The text that I had read this morning, well, how is it? Now, wait a minute, Tim, 586. We were all about the Babylonians. I mean, you've gone on and on and on and on about the Babylonians. Well, what happened to them? Well, what happened to them is what's described in Daniel chapter 5. And we'll get to the book of Daniel in a few weeks. But again, we'll be going back in history from where we are now. Do you see how confusing that, that can be? But we're told in the book of Daniel chapter 5 that the king Belshazzar had this great feast. And here's what he did in that great feast. We're told that he brought out the utensils that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And they were engaged in all kind of depravity and debauchery, uh, the drinking and all of the things that went on with that. And in the course, in the midst of that great banquet or party, this phenomenon, and again, this is a phrase that, we hear used in the culture many times. But this hand appears and writes on the wall. Again, how many of you have heard the phrase, the handwriting on the wall? Reference to what? It's, it's done. It's over. 
And that, that handwriting on the wall clearly stated, your day has come. This is indeed the end of your empire. It really resolves when we get to the book of Habakkuk, way on down the line, before the, before the Jerusalem is actually sacked and raised and destroyed, Habakkuk is how God, how is it God that you could destroy your beloved people with these wicked and vile Babylonians? God gave them, him kind of the same answer he gives to us. You just watch out. I'm God, and it'll work according to my plan and my timetable. The upshot is that the Babylonians got the judgment due them for their wickedness against God. And so we're told as chapter 5 closes in the book of Daniel that one named Darius the Mede comes in and in the name of Cyrus conquers Babylon. And so Babylon is destroyed. It is no longer the preeminent world power in the world, again, in 539 B.C. Now, evidently, with the fall of Israel in 722 B.C., another 150 years before the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of Israel, some Jews had already begun migrating into Persia. And so there were some Jews there, most likely, and I, I really never saw any commentators really pick up on this very much. Presumably, though, that at the fall of Babylon, some of those Jews were taken on into Persia. And certainly some of the leading lights among the Jews would have been taken into uh, Persia where they would serve uh, the Persian king. And so we know, again, from our studies of Ezra and Nehemiah, that uh, beginning in 539, some Jews began returning uh, to uh, Jerusalem. And they, they go because Cyrus says they should. Cyrus says that they could. But we know from reading those books that, that the, the work never really got to going real well. And in fact, it ultimately stalls. And, and we find there in the book of Ezra this stern letter from the successor to Cyrus, Darius, do not in any way hinder this rebuilding effort in Jerusalem. And that if you do, a beam should be taken from your house and you should be impaled upon it for interfering with that particular work. And so Darius and uh, certainly later the, the son of our king here at uh, Ahasuerus, uh, his son Artaxerxes, which we see in Nehemiah, they want to be seen as carrying on the work begun by Cyrus. Kind of a modern example. In the 1960s, I was also alive in the 1960s, it would have been popular for a Democrat to claim the name of John F. Kennedy that he was carrying on the work begun by John Kennedy. Later, it would have been a very popular thing for a Republican to say, I'm carrying on the great work that was begun by Ronald Reagan. Okay, that, that would be kind of a, 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 a virtue by association. And so these subsequent kings found it to their favor to continue and make the claim, I'm completing that which Cyrus started. Now, tragically for these succeeding kings, this Darius, not the Darius that kind of was the hands-on guy, uh, the sight guy when Babylon fell, but a, a later Darius that was the king that would be uh, the king of, or the, the father of the king that we're going to study today. In 490 B.C., this particular Darius is defeated at the Battle of Marathon by the Greeks. And then his son, our king here today, again, Ahasuerus. Now, I'm going to quit saying that because it's easier to say his Greek name, Xerxes. Xerxes and our king here are the same king, different names. Just put that in your brain because I'm going to start saying Xerxes. 
In 480 B.C., Xerxes becomes involved with the Spartans defending Athens at a place called Thermopylae Pass. And 300 Spartans withhold the entire, withstand the onslaught of the entire Persian army and delay that army enough that eventually they have to abandon their conquest of Greece. Now, for you culturally uh, involved people, that was made into a movie a few years back called The 300. I've never seen it. I'm not advocating you see it. I'm not, say, I'm not saying don't see it. I'm just saying that's, what, that's the historical setting of the 300. Now, I didn't know this until Friday night, but I was told that we have, as one of our church members, an expert on all things Star Wars. Seriously, seriously. And so when I heard that, and I've seen a couple of Star Wars movies. I, I don't really have a, a whole lot of knowledge. And y'all know science fiction isn't my thing. But I said, well, you know, I've been listening to, to a podcaster. And he says that this current, I think it's a television series, The Mandalorian. Okay. The Mandalorian, which prayerfully I'll never see. But, but again, that's another story for another day. But... This particular podcaster said that the Mandalorian is, in, in essence, an analogy of following the pattern established in the book of Esther, again, of a people exiled from their planet, living in hope of fulfilling the prophecies to return to that planet. So there's, there's a couple of kind of contemporary re reference points. Uh, both 300 and the Mandalorian seem to have a point of contact there with our story. And so the book of Esther occurs, and I think uh, maybe b both Brad and Drew mentioned this, between Ezra 6 and 7. In 458 B.C., uh, 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 Ezra uh, returns. In 444, Nehemiah returns, and this work will ultimately be completed of rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding uh, the temple. And so at, as our story opens, there's a large number of, of Jews living uh, in Persia. Now, many people have had problems and still have problems with the book of Esther. Everybody knows what the number one problem of the book of Esther is, right? Everybody nod your head. Not, everybody nod your head. I won't, call, I, won't ask, I won't call you by name and make you tell us the whole crap. But there's no mention of God in the book of Esther. Uh, there's one of two books in the Bible that God's name is not called uh, in uh, the book of Esther. I don't necessarily have uh, the perfect explanation. Some say it was such a secular time that God was uh, forgotten. I'm not sure I buy that 100%, but that's one way uh, of, of expressing how it is that, um, that God's name is not mentioned. They say it was such a secular time that we don't see within the book an objection to Esther marrying a pagan. Again, this was very close to the time in which both Ezra and Nehemiah would object to the marrying of pagan women. And so uh, it's kind of a strange thing that it's, the, the book is silent about the morality of Esther's marriage to this particular uh, king. And so people read it and they scratch uh, their head but I don't think it's as secular, maybe, as people think it is. And I think that God is not mentioned as an example of the supreme understatement. That the fact that his name is not named in the book screams out that God is present. And he is superintending all of the affairs of this people in this distant and far away and yes pagan land but God is still there and he is ruling and he is reigning and he is working all things according to his own will he's working all things for the good of those who love him he's working all things to demonstrate once again his great faithfulness and so uh, people object to it and criticize the book 
but I think it, it is a great book, and I don't, I don't think it should be criticized as being uh, as secular as some would say it is. So those things being said, let's get into the masterful narrative. And this is indeed a well-written book. It is a great, great story. Now, I have to give a little nod to one of my former teachers. In fact, uh, she would go down, I guess, as my favorite teacher, Miss Phyllis S. Payne, that taught me as a sophomore in high school how to read a short story. And so we're going to kind of analyze this thing and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I may bore you out of your skull, or you may think this is quite intriguing. But I want to look at it from a number of different perspectives versus the way I normally run straight through the text. In other words, I'm going to do things a little differently today. Now, every time I say that, I'm going to do things a little differently. I'm reminded of one of the nine pastors that served at the church I grew up in over the course of 20 years. Now, do the math there. But he was a, an odd duck at best. And it always caused people to kind of, oh, no, what's fixing to happen when he would stand up? We're going to do things a little differently here today. But let's think, first of all, about the author and its purpose. Who wrote it? We don't know. We know God inspired that author. My suspicion is that possibly uh, Mordecai and Esther had some type of hand in making sure the information uh, was passed down. Uh, now, I'm going to do the, the, the five W's and an H that I often do. That's the five W's and H of journalism, also taught to me by one Phyllis S. Payne. But we're going to do the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So uh, the what is all about the threat to the people of God, and it is the continuing of the story of the conflict between the two kingdoms, the conflict between the two seeds, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman is the conflict that underlies this great story. The when, I, I suspect it was written fairly soon after the events happened, where most likely written in Persia, probably again before 330 B.C., what happened in 330 B.C.? Gotcha. Alexander the Great conquers the Persians. So, we don't see the Greek influence in the book. So, probably written between the events when they occurred in 330 uh, B.C. Why? They say that basically to explain this great feast uh, in uh, Israel of Purim, uh, where God again demonstrates His faithfulness and people celebrate to be reminded of his goodness to his people. And so the how the book was written, probably contributions by the eyewitness, compiled oral and written accounts, but certainly by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is history. It's not a story. It's not a fiction. It's not legend. It does not begin with once upon a time. It begins with a particular time, place, setting, with particular people involved. It is, again, well-crafted history. Some people will look at me and know if it's history, it's got to be boring. Have you ever seen or read The Band of Brothers? That's history by one contemporary historian, Stephen Ambrose. I think it's well written. I was mentioning to some of our ladies this morning, I read some things by a man named Hampton Sides and writes history really well. We stood on top of the Continental Divide a few weeks ago, and a guy said that he had just finished the book Undaunted Courage, the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition that crossed that Continental Divide. Great story. This uh, Hampton Sides also wrote, uh, wrote a book called Hellhound on His Trail, the story of the FBI and their capture of one James Earl Ray, who assassinated Martin Luther King. Just as a sidelight that called my attention, James Earl Ray bought the rifle he used to assassinate Martin Luther King in Birmingham, Alabama. So, very intriguing bit there. So, fiction can be, excuse me, history can be well written. Now, one of the things that drives me crazy sometimes, either before or after a movie, this was based on a true story. Now, what drives me crazy? Well, what's true and what's made up? It just aggravates the fire out of me. Either tell it to me like it happened or tell me it's fiction, but don't try to blur the lines. And so, 
These lines aren't blurred. It is history. And so this author uses a large number of elements and devices and structure to st- tell a story. All of the elements of character, plot, conflict, and setting are woven together to create drama and tension and to make it readable. And so the first element is that of setting. As I said, it's not once upon a time. It's not long, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. It is in the nation of Persia, a nation that was the greatest kingdom in the history of the world up until uh, that time. It was larger than Egypt. It was larger than Assyria. It was larger than Babylon. It was the kingdom that's described in Daniel 2, his vision of the great statue. It is the kingdom that supplants the kingdom, characterizes the head of gold. It is that of the, uh, the kingdom made of silver. And this kingdom had a capital in the city of Susa, and it was a a kingdom made up of 127 provinces. And out of all the many things that we may criticize Xerxes for, he seemed to be very adept at administrating this exceptionally large kingdom. If you ask me and request it in writing, I will send you an email. But one young man, this podcaster I've been listening to, took a map of the ancient Uh, Persian Empire, and through technology, dropped it on top of a map of the United States. The Persian kingdom was bigger than our lower 48. So it was a big, big nation without emails, without cell phones, without all types of modern communications. In fact, if you put, and when you drop that map, now you got to kind of think with me a minute. If you take that map and pull it over and drop it onto the map of the lower 48, you lo- and you locate Jerusalem in Wichita, Kansas, okay, then you would have the, the western extent of that nation, Ethiopia, would be uh, on the west coast, on the Pacific West Coast. And India, the eastern boundary, would extend into the Atlantic Ocean. That's a big nation from east to to west. Just to give you some uh, perspective, if, you, if Jerusalem were in Wichita, Kansas, then the city in question today, Susa, would be in West Virginia. Babylon would be in Louisville, Kentucky. And so these exiles that returned to Jerusalem from Louisville slash Babylon would have walked about 550 miles. Those that returned from Susa namely Nehemiah, to Jerusalem would have traveled about 890 miles. And and we think of the Middle East, and again, Israel is a very, very, very small nation. But when you think about the entirety of these ancient kingdoms, they were large. And so the setting, ancient Persia, and then the, the more narrowly defined setting, as chapter 1 off, uh, opens, is this debauched, depraved banquet in which will set in motion the balance of the story. Now, you remember I said something about eyewitnesses. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. Colors and different ways of describing what was in the room where the banquet took place. What does that tell you? Somebody saw it. Somebody was there, has contributed to our story for the sake of accuracy. Now, I'm going to give you the characters, as they say, in order of appearance, okay? Now, it's interesting. I was sitting with Drew and Jude the other day, and Jude is reading, and he's doing a great job. And Drew asked him, well, who is the story about? Usually, we want to know who is the story about. We are interested in characters because we're people, and characters are people. So the characters, this king, and I've told you before, uh, his Greek name is Xerxes. And in this king, and certainly with his first wife Vashti, we see the carrying out of the curse from Genesis 3.16. The desire of the wife shall be for the husband, but what? He shall crush you. He shall rule over you. Imagine that, seeing that thing being carried out through the course of history, even pagan history. So he is a despotic, even a cruel husband who crushes his wife. He is easy manipulated. He's a bumbler. He's buffoonish. Uh, He would fit right into Everybody Loves Raymond or Fred Flintstone or any of these buffoons of popular uh, culture. He is mercurial. He He is flighty. 
We hear him many times. I will give you up to half of my kingdom. He's a blowhard. He's sensual. He likes the women. And again, that's not a very good thing. In a sense, he's very Shakespearean in all his faults, maybe even a bit like Hamlet in his despairing uh, moments. And yet, ancient historians judge him as not the worst and a fairly complicated a competent ruler. The second character is this first wife, Vashti. Should we see her as just the consummate rebellious wife? Should we see her as that spunky woman that knows how to deal with her man? Well, again, probably what the king was asking her to do in terms of appearing with the crown could have been appear before my friends so I can show you off and the only thing you need to bring and the only thing you need to wear is that crown. And so maybe she chose to say no because she would not be demeaned and debased in such a fashion. But again, what do we see? The conflict, the carrying out of the curse, the conflict within the home. Then we see Mordecai, our protagonist and hero, along with Esther. Like Joseph and Daniel, he rises to prominence in a pagan court. He is of the house of Benjamin. Again, the same uh, house that the first king of Israel was from, King Saul. He is a wise advisor and he's a mover and a shaker behind the scenes. Esther is our heroine, our protagonist. She's she's an orphan. She is a discerning opportunist, although initially reluctant to act on behalf of her people. She is increasingly willing and skilled to use her situation to the advantage of her uh, people. She knows how to apply the levers of power. She knows how to deal with her husband. And then we have Haman, the villain, the antagonist. And I would say he is an antichrist, one of many antichrists to appear in the Word of God as those one that would destroy and oppose God and his people. He is a wealthy Amalekite. He is a descendant of Agog, a race that should have been destroyed when Saul was a king. If you'll remember from 1 Samuel 15, Samuel asked Saul, what is that bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ears? It is better to obey than sacrifice. And Saul's disobedience almost leads to the extermination of God's people by this descendant of Agog. And so we have the plot. Now, you know me, I like to make things simple. You can divide it this way. Three steps, three-act play. The ascension, chapters 1 and 2. The intercession, chapters 3 through 8, and the intervention, chapters 9 and 10. Works kind of nicely. Ascension, intercession, and intervention. And in this, we have this tremendous plot. Now, I have tremendously impressed Brad Aldridge with my use of alliteration over the years, which makes my sermons incredibly um, delightful to listen to and, and easy to remember. And so he's impressed when I have, uh, you know, three or four or five. Let me give you the 11 P's of the plot line of the book of Esther. That is the party, the pageant, the plots, the plea, the petitions, the plan, the paradox, the publication, the pummeling, the proclamations, and the pronouncements. There's your story of Esther. You divide it into the three acts, the ascension, the intercession, and the intervention, and you've got about four scenes in each act. So, The story begins with the party in chapter 1 and 2. In that, the the situation is created that leads to the pageant whereby Esther is selected to replace the deposed Vashti that she would be the wife of the king of Persia. And then we find, beginning in chapter 2, verse 19, uh, the plots, a plot to assassinate the king that is discovered by Mordecai, and he uh, reveals that plot and saves the king's life, and that's going to figure into our story later. But there's also this very vile, wicked, and evil plan, this scheme that is going to be put into place by this Haman to destroy the Jews. So we have competing plots uh, there. And then we have the plea that Mordecai pleads with Esther to go and intercede for the king. That was the text that we read, that you should go. And you should go because you don't know that this is not just the time that you were born to live and to serve for this particular uh, purpose. 
We see the petitions made by Esther to the king in which she petitions him to allow her to host these two great banquets. And so we see uh, the plan, and the plan is that Haman will hang Mordecai. And then we see what the, the delicious plot twist, the irony of the story, the genius of the story is this paradox, this turning where this scheme, this plan, this plot to hang Mordecai is reversed. And who gets hung on the gallows that Mordecai had constructed, I mean that Haman had constructed? Well, Haman himself gets hung there. And so what we have, again, because of the scheming of Haman, is a decree that the Jews shall be murdered. And what we, we see here is this idea that once the king has established a policy or made a law, he can't just say, oh, no, it doesn't matter anymore. We see that in Daniel, I believe it's chapter 6, verse 8. When at the ascent of Darius there in Babylon, the schemers that are surrounding Daniel say, listen, we need to get this guy, and here's the way we're going to get him. The only way we're going to find anything wrong with him is if we use his God against him. And so they go to the king, they go to Darius and say, listen, you need to make a law that you cannot pray to the true God, to Daniel's God. And so Daniel defies that. And he's placed in the lion's den. The king didn't want to do it, but he made a law that could not be repealed. Same thing here. The law cannot be repealed. But again, there's going to be a plan to get around that particular law. And so we see the the publication of how they're going to deal with it, that the Jews can indeed defend themselves. And they do. And they'll eventually kill 75,800 of those that would attack them. In verse 14, you'll also see of chapter 8, in the publication, you'll see a kind of an ancient Pony Express. How did they get the word out across this great large kingdom that would span coast to coast? By fast horses, the forerunner to the Pony Express. And so chapter 9 is the pummeling, that is the Jews uh, defend themselves, then the proclamation to establish this great festival of Purim to celebrate God's deliverance through Esther of the people from this evil scheme, the evil plan of this man, Haman. And then we see the final thing, the pronouncement of all that this is intended, what happened to Mordecai after it was all over, and how the Jews were blessed to be protected by him. So there's your plot, 11 Ps of the book of Esther. The theme of the book of Esther I think it's God's providential care for his people and his faithfulness to carry out his plan. Again, I, I, think, I think the whole book, while the name of God is not written down, it screams that God has taken watch care over his people. And no matter the schemes of men, no matter the wickedness of the seed of the serpent, that the seed of the woman shall prevail and God will protect his people, and deliver his people. And so we see that theme and that that evil will be punished. Haman gets his day there. You might even say something if you want to be kind of in terms of a cliche, be sure your sins shall find you out as Haman's sins were exposed. We see all of these conflicts. In literature, you usually talk about conflicts being man versus man or man versus woman. We see the king versus Vashti. We see Mordecai versus Esther. We see Haman versus the Jews, and more narrowly, Haman versus Mordecai. We see man versus society. The king can't even reverse his own law. We see man versus evil. Uh, Both Esther and Mordecai oppose uh, this great evil. And then man against God as Haman fights and rails against God. And so... In this great conflict, we once again see this great reality of the conflict between the two seeds, the seed of the serpent and that which will be the seed of the woman. Now, one interesting thing about the books is is the number of literary devices our author employs, and he uses a lot of irony. Again, I remember from my high school days, the writer O. Henry. If you've never read The Ransom of Red Chief, uh, very much a short story 
kind of like Home Alone, okay? And uh, maybe the gift of the Magi. But O. Henry was noted for having this kind of plot twist at the end, the irony of the way the story ends. Well, again, what's the irony of the book of Esther? That this one who is so dedicated to the destruction of the Jews, ironically, is destroyed by the very instrument he designed to punish and destroy these Jews. So you have irony. You have humor. I've told you that... uh, the king is very much kind of a, there for comic relief almost, that, that he is so easily manipulated. He, he's such a goofball. He's so, so unaware of who's acting upon him and what they are doing uh, to him. We see all of these plot twists. Mordecai's rise and Haman's uh, demise. That, that the Jews would be destroyed by Haman. And Hester, Esther receives the, the very household of Haman. That... that Haman is elevated, but yet Mordecai ends up with the signet ring that represents the authority of the king. And so all through the book, we see these devices uh, employed to advance uh, our narrative. The book uses a lot of pairs, okay? The the things are just paired against each other to, to contrast or complement. You have Esther and Vashti. You have Mordecai and Haman. You have Haman's plot and Esther's plots. You have the two feasts that Esther uh, requests. We have two hangings. Mordecai plans, to, I mean, Haman plans to hang uh, Mordecai, but it's Mordecai that is hung. We have the, the signet ring given to Haman, but eventually given to Mordecai. We said, have Esther receiving Haman's house. The big one is the sorrow of the Jews is turned to gladness at the great reversal of the deliverance that comes through Esther. On and on we could go. He uses a lot of understatement. And again, I think the great understatement is what? That the name of God is not written, but he's in every word on every page. And so we can see if you want to follow the the action of the story, the action rises through chapter 7 and falls toward the ultimate denouement, the unraveling of the story. How does it all end? So in saying all of these things, what's the contemporary relevance of the book of Esther? So what? Okay, nice story. You've convinced me it was well, well done. We ought to read it. So what? Well, again, going back to the verse that we started with, verses 14 and 15 out of chapter 4. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, I want to say to you, to every single one of you here today, that that applies to each and every one of us. Wherever you are in life, whatever the situation is, whatever the affliction that you're going through, whatever the pleasure you're experiencing, whatever the relationships that you're in or whatever the relationships that are broken, God has brought you to this situation for such a time as this that you would be a witness to His grace, to His glory, to His gospel. And so we see the so what that we're here by design. We're here for God's purpose. And so we see here the reminder of God's overarching and undergirding providence. God was present, though not stated in the book of Esther, and God is present in your life, superintending the affairs of your life at a personal level. level. And folks, I think the world has gone absolutely stark raving mad I, I want to go out and, and stomp people. I, I'll just be honestly. And God is superintending even the stupidity of our age to accomplish His great purpose and to establish and to consummate the victory of the seed of the woman over the seed of the serpent. No matter what that headline says, I don't know exactly what it's 
pointing to, if it's Gog or Magog or whatever it is it's talking about. I know this, that whatever that headline is, it is a part of what God is moving forward to the great victory of the seed of the woman. That's the story. That's his story. That's our story. And so we see that in the book of Esther. We can criticize it and say that they lack moral character, that uh, Esther and Mordecai are opportunist or Esther compromises. You miss the point. You miss the point if that's where you want to dwell. Well, very quickly, let's look at some of the ways that we see the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ on display. It seems to me that just as the father sends the son, Mordecai sends Esther to save her people, to deliver her people, to intercede for her people. Esther sacrifices herself for her people. And not to be crude, please don't. She literally lays down her life for her people. She gives herself away for the sake of her people, to deliver her people. She foreshadows as a woman that the coming serpent-crushing seed, which is Jesus Christ, she's not the ultimate serpent crusher, but she's looking forward to that one whose name is Jesus. Again, we see that God's people are delivered through judgment. In this case, the judgment that fell on Haman. In the ultimate case, we're delivered by the judgment that fell upon our Savior, Jesus Christ, at the cross of Calvary. The, the, Haman got what he deserved. Haman deserved to be on that gallows. But the great reversal is Jesus did not deserve to be lifted up on that cross. But he was to suffer a curse for us. What Haman meant for evil, and, and, and even the, the kind of the larger context, what was meant for evil, as Joseph noted so long ago, you brothers meant what you did for evil, but God meant it for good. God brought all of these affairs about. Place Esther at the right place at the right time to be the deliverer of her people. This, this story really really turns on this phrase that the Jews had their sorrow turned to gladness, that their, their mourning turned into a holiday. Is that not the story of the gospel? That the sorrow and the mourning of the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we see the whole story, do we not see that our mourning has been turned into joy? that our sins are forgiven, and that death has been defeated. Maybe the final thing that I would say, and I've said this so many times, Xerxes was a buffoon. Maybe historians think he was pretty competent, but he was not the ultimate king. And every king and every ruler that served before Xerxes and after Xerxes only reinforces and only highlights that what we need is not just a good king, but we need a perfect king. And his name is Jesus Christ. And in him we shall place our hope. And I think we see kind of in shadowy ways, but I think we see the message of the fulfillment of of the promise that opens, opens even the entirety of the Bible, that there will be one that will crush the kingdom of the serpent, and he will rule and he will reign forever and ever and ever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your truth, for this absolutely magnificent story. And Lord, I feel like I've stumbled and fumbled my way through it, but I pray that what has come out of this and what the people see is, again, your great faithfulness, a faithfulness that went so far is that you would send 
your only begotten Son into this sin-forsaken world that He would offer Himself as a sacrifice for our salvation. We thank You for that truth. May we rest in it. In Jesus' name, amen.